Welcome to another in our 30th anniversary series of interviews here at the Festival of the Sound in Paris Sound, Ontario, Canada. My name's Keith Horner. And today we have Mark Johnson, formerly with the Vermeer String Quartet and Jerzy Kaplanik, who's with the Penderecki String Quartet. Would you please welcome them to the Festival of the Sound? Uh, together, Mark and Jerzy have played string quartets professionally for pretty well seven decades. That's a lot of concerts and uh, a lot of accumulated wisdom. And this evening they've agreed to share some of this experience and a career uh, spent playing string quartets with us. Uh, Mark was with the Vermeer String Quartet. He joined shortly after they began. That was back in 1969. And the Vermeer played its last concert just about two years ago now, just over two years ago, um, in New York. And Jerzy has been with the... Jerzy was almost a founding member of the uh, Penderecki String Quartet. Um, he joined in year two. And uh, the Penderecki have been residents uh, here in Canada at Wilfrid Laurier University for the past uh, 16 seasons. So uh, welcome again. Uh, can we talk about early days first, about the founding of the quartets? Why was the, what were the circumstances that led to the Vermeer being uh, founded? Mark. Uh, rather easy to explain. The, the uh, chairman of the music department at Northern Illinois University wanted to have a string quartet in residence, and he wanted to have the fun of forming a new quartet rather than hiring an existing quartet. And so he spent himself uh, about a year searching out a first violinist. Um, and he went all over the country, and in fact all over the world, listening to violinists play, and he made himself a short list and uh, brought uh, about five different people to campus to interview, and um, uh, he wound up choosing my longtime colleague Shmuel Ashkenazi uh, as the first violinist of this new and, and as yet unnamed quartet, and gave him really uh, completely carte blanche to, to form uh, a quartet. Quartet. And so Schmoyle chose a second, and the two of them chose a third, and the three of them chose a fourth, and that was how the quartet began. It, it, as, as it turns out, the four original members uh, had all been friends and colleagues at the Marlboro Festival in Vermont. And so that's in addition to Northern Illinois University, the Marlboro Festival is sort of the second birthplace of the Vermeer Quartet. Thanks. And uh, Yoshi, yes. why was the Penderecki formed? Yes, at first, uh, all the members of the quartet, there were students at the Academy of Music in Katowice. They were all Polish. I wasn't one of them. And um, they were taking chair music for credit. And they loved it so much that they started to play uh, concerts outside of the school. And in 1986, they uh, were part of the competition in a chamber music competition in Łódź, where they received a special award, where they, they received the first prize, but also they received the special award from Maestro Penderecki for performing his second string quartet. And at this point, the group was already having some professional engagements and so on, and uh, the group didn't have a name. So somebody came up with the idea of asking Maestro Penderecki for permission to use the name, of, uh, his name as name of the quartet, which, which he agreed to. And then at that point, the quartet went and played for him and worked with him on his, his uh, pieces. And um, mm -hmm. as a result of, of those concerts, um, the quartet, the quartet uh, received a, a scholarship in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to study with Fine Arts Quartet, good mm. colleagues of yours, right? Ah, yes. So it was a, a long-term investment in the name that uh, really paid off. It was a, a right. wise investment. Um, and you could also ask uh, Mr. Penderecki uh, for his permission. Now, you couldn't ask uh, Vermeer his permission. <laughs> no, how, no. How did the Vermeer name come yeah. about? Well, it, it, of course, I was not a founding member, but as I understand it, um, uh, first of all, there was some pressure to find a name very quickly, which is uh, exactly the situation that you were in. Um, 
And my colleagues, they didn't want, first of all, to choose the name of a composer like Penderecki because they didn't want to be pigeonholed, to be sort of uh, associated with that name forever. And, and, and there's some sense in that. I mean, I, I pity the poor Janáček Quartet who had to play those two pieces and nobody wanted to hear them play anything else. And as wonderfully as they played them, it became a burden uh, to them to be named after a composer. I assume that you didn't have this, this problem. Um, and we didn't want to be named after a geographical location. The Tokyo Quartet wound up in New York. The Cleveland Quartet wound up in Rochester. The, I, I mean, you just, it, it, it's not very safe to name yourself after a, a city. And, and finally, someone said, why, why does it have to be specifically musical or geographic? Why can't it be something else in the arts? And someone said Rembrandt, and it didn't sound right. And someone else said Vermeer, and it did. And, and I, I think it worked rather well for us. It was, uh, at that time, uh, unusual. Uh, but not difficult to remember. <coughs> and since that time, there have been a, a, a number of, we consider it a, 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 uh, that, that we were trailblazers in naming ourselves after yeah. a painter, and there have been, there's a, um, a Miro quartet, and there's a, 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 a Cassatt quartet, and there, I mean, there are any number of quartets who now have chosen this path, and, and I think it's a, a, a fairly good one, and, and maybe a fairly safe one, that you, you can go ahead and make your own uh, career and your own personality without uh, having been tagged by your name. Yeah, I think names used to be very often either, as you've said, composers or um, a musical name, like the Allegri Quartet, uh, we've had at the festival many times, or a musical association, I guess, like the Amadeus <laughs> Quartet. Um, Yerji, what w did you see your core repertory as? You know, in other words, why was the f what was the quartet formed to, uh, to play? Well, the quartet wanted to play all the repertoire, and um, of, of course, starting with the you know, with the heart of string quartet repertoire with Haydn's and Beethoven's and Bartok's. But uh, we all, always were interested to try uh, contemporary pieces. We were always trying to commission new works, and we're always trying to work with the composers. And that's how this whole idea started with naming the quartet as, as Penderecki Quartet, which actually. Once you said that, it reminded me how difficult at first was to communicate to sponsors and to to um, chamber music uh, societies were in, which were inviting us to play, yeah. to communicate to them that actually yes, we we are playing Beethoven, we are playing high. I thought you know, for many years as a as a new music quartet. That's exactly primarily. right. Yeah. Many people would perceive us this way, and and it was, was difficult to ch change as that. Listeners, we know that string quartets have different sounds and different personalities. And I just want to try something, first of all, on, on you, Mark. Um, yeah, when, you're not going to get very far. Well, I think, <laughs> I think I might, because, you know. Uh, anyway, let, let's listen. When you um, gave your last concert for the Chamber Music Society of New York, um, of Lincoln Center in New York, the New York Times did a review, and it described your sound there as, and I quote, a rich, warm sound with a firm bass, it's got to agree with that, a firm bass and a velvety top, polished and seductive. Now, that was your final concert. Is that about right for the sound of the Vermeer? I, I suppose that it's that it's pretty close, but but he does ignore the middle, and the middle of a string quartet is a very important part. Yes. So uh, it's it it it's uh, possible that my playing is uh, sometimes firm, and it certainly is possible that Schmoel's playing is is very sensual. Um, but uh, as with any string quartet, the, the middle of the quartet is sort of where the quartet lives and dies. You, you get a good cellist and a good violinist together, and, 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 and they will sound rather well together. Their voices are <coughs> quite far apart, and it's the glue in the middle that yes. actually gives the quartet the sound. I yeah, think. I agree. It's the sum of the parts. There's, there's no mm. question about that. But what is that sum? Did, were you aiming for a particular sound? Well, we were aiming for a different sound um, uh, uh, virtually from phrase to phrase. I mean, we let, we, 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 it's absolutely one of our, our only um, laws in the quartet is that we let the phrase dictate the sound. We let the composer dictate uh -huh. the sound, and we don't dictate to the composer how he should sound. So you would produce a different sound in, in Haydn than you would in Szymanowski? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. With, with no question whatsoever. 
And Yerji, um, Benderetsky and Mozart, different sound, right? Oh, totally. <laughs> I would talk, I would, I would 100% agree that uh, to find for each group the association with, with a certain composer, a certain period in music, and, and finding the own uh, sound for, for that very uh, composer, it's, it's uh, what, what we spending all days rehearsing. That's what we do. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. uh, um, both quartets have had long residences at universities. Now, is that really crucial for the existence of a string quartet in, in North America these days? Well, I, I think I'm not sure how it is exactly that the that the university and uh, uh, colleges and conservatories became the home of the string quartet, but they did, and and certainly one effect that it has is if if part of your income is a salary drawn from an institution like that, you're protected somewhat from the vicissitudes of the touring career, and so if you have a bad touring year. Um, you still have a, a, an income coming from at, at least one of your jobs is, has, a, has a stable income attached to it. Um, and I, I think that it's very difficult these days for a string quartet um, to survive just on playing concerts. Uh, uh, almost every, even the, the quartets who don't have a full-time association with uh, uh, a learning institution of some sort uh, have uh, at least relationships that are sort of adjacent to their careers with such institutions. Mm -hmm. The uh, mother of one string quartet player was here last week and she was telling me that her daughter has left a, a certain fairly well-known string quartet, certainly a name string quartet, and left behind an income of $9,000 a year. Mm -hmm. She's now earning $90,000 a year uh, in an orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> and this was after many years in the string quartet. Yerji, what's your relationship with Wilfred Laurier as a string quartet? The quartet is called the Quartet in Residence, and uh, we are uh, at, at Wilfred Laurier University, and we teach there. We teach the studios, we teach the chamber music. We actually run the whole string department together with our former cellist, Paul Pulford. He's the only other um, string teacher in our school, so we're actually responsible for the whole string program. So it's a big responsibility, and the residences vary from quartet to quartet, from school to school, and uh, in our case, uh, we, we get very busy. And during the season, um, the, to keep the two careers going, it's, it's actually quite challenging. The good thing is that in Canada, we only have 12 weeks terms, <laughs> so it's actually not too bad, because after 24 weeks, you know, uh, uh, we, we can focus more more on, on touring, and during the, uh, those tw 12, year, uh, 12 weeks terms, we usually don't travel extensively. We, may, we might go away for 10 days at the most, because when we come back, we need to make up the lessons. And, and you know, there, there's uh, lots of responsibilities. Uh, the students uh, have to have their teachers in place, and um, so, uh, but on the other hand, Loria provided us uh, also with the, with the home in terms of place to be, place to travel from, place to rehearse. We have great support all around, and and that has been really um, uh, an, an amazing for for. for the um, now, playing in a string quartet is being compared to uh, to being married. Is this a, is this an analogy you like? <laughs> well. Uh, no, frankly. Um, um, one, one difference between a marriage and a string quartet is that it, in forming a string quartet, uh, you know the exact reason why you're taking on this relationship. You have, you have the great string quartet repertoire, and most people have no idea why they got married. Um, and maybe they think they did at the time, but in retrospect, perhaps they still think they had no idea why they got married. So I, I've been married happily for 38 years, and, and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, um, uh, unfamiliar with the, uh, the, the fact of being married, but, but string quartets, it, it of course is a more complicated relationship because in a group of four people there are six one-to-one -one relationships, if you think about it. Yes. Um, and so there, there are an awful lot more things that can go wrong um, among four people than between two. 
Um, but other than that, I, I don't think, I mean, it's, we have a professional relationship which is very different from the kind of uh, personal relationship that, that I have in my marriage with my wife. When, the first time I went on tour with the Vermeer Quartet, they'd been playing three seasons already. And we arrived in Ottawa, um, checked into the hotel. We had a little bit of time to get some dinner before going to the concert hall. I went to my room, unpacked, came down to the restaurant in the hotel, and in one corner was one of my colleagues, in another corner was the other one of my colleagues, and in the third corner, the third one, and I didn't know what to do. We had, we had never discussed this, but they had arrived at the point where they didn't eat together. Uh, uh, and in fact, we basically didn't travel together, didn't stay together. We agreed where to meet. We, we came to rehearse in the hall. We came to, I mean, we, we were uh, very dependable about our obligations to each other and to the business. Um, but, but we did not spend time together outside the quartet. Now that I'm not playing quartets, I'm quite good friends with my colleagues. Uh, but, but, it, but, other, but before that, it, it really is a, uh, we had a cordial relationship uh, in the best of times, but it was a business relationship. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the Amadeus Quartet had a reputation for having a similar sort of relationship, mm -hmm. and, and there were... Well, yeah, I mean, we learned from them. We, 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 I mean, we talked to our, to our older colleagues about, you know, how, how to go about being a string quartet, and we talked to the then remaining members of the Budapest Pest Quartet and to the, to the Amadeus guys, and, yeah. and this was some of the advice that we got from them. As you Interesting. Know. Yeah. Yoshi, can I ask you, is it important to be buddies and friends to make music together? I don't think that it's important that that, that it's a must to, to have this kind of relationship, but in our group we actually uh, did not have this kind of people to, to give us advice and mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we travel together we you know we actually sometimes stay in a hotel and we're next to each other and we don't get get upset with that even though when we check in we always ask can you put us in different scatter, parts of the, scatter the hotel rooms. and 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 usually the person who checks us in is like excuse me <laughs> it's like they just can't always believe that we actually you know we work together and we don't want to be next to each other in a hotel but but uh, it, it is a very complex relationship, and and over the years, I mean, there's time that we, we that there are times that we, we travel together and we spend time social time together. But there's also time when when we need to be apart, when we need to t take our own space, and um, mm. and 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 just just have that ex extra privacy. Privacy. Yes. How traumatic is it when you change a member? <laughs> First of all, um, Mark, from well, Vermeer's point of view. Uh, uh, to give you some measurement of it, we, we always felt that it took us five years to, to come back to the place where we were with a new member. Because there's, an, I mean, we, the, the string quartet repertoire is enormous, and you don't play it all in one season. You, you play it over a, a three or four or five year period, you may come back to most of the standard repertoire. Um, and so, not, on, but not only is there music to learn, but you have to tend to I mean, half of what goes on in a quartet rehearsal is learning the music, but the other half is tending the machine, uh, is, is keeping the machine tuned up. And, and un until you've been playing with each other for, for months and months, years, really, um, you don't have the kind of instantaneous response to each other that you have uh, when, when you have a long-standing relationship with all three of your colleagues. So it is, it is traumatic, uh, leaving, leaving aside the personal. Often when someone leaves a quartet, it leaves unhappiness behind. Uh, and so you have to deal with that. But even in the best of circumstances, when, when someone leaves with plenty of notice and for good reason and everyone understands it, it still takes a long time to bring the quartet machine back into being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she. Yeah, totally, you're going through this. Yeah, I, was, I would totally agree with that. And and but something that I always enjoy in a uh, member ch change of the member in a group uh, in, in just looking at that positively is is for myself to go through uh, the repertoire once more and. Uh, I have to confront all my decisions because you know you rework every piece with new member, and the new member always brings something new uh, on every level, and and it's been kind of fascinating for me to, after many years of playing the same piece, to go back and and rework and uh, justify all my decisions. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's that's the part that I'm looking forward to when that happens. It, it's not that you know. <laughs> 
I, I, I happened to walk past a, an uh, open door uh, uh, on the other side of which the Alban Berg Quartet was, the, the, the recently retired great Alban Berg Quartet were rehearsing. Um, and I heard just as I walked past the following words, they were in German, but I'll, I'll give them to you in English. One of the members was saying, yeah, but if we do it that way, it means we've been wrong for 25 years. So imagine a new member trying to fit into that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, um, a different question now, what can an audience do or give you that, that really makes you perform better or to your full potential at a concert? Well, I, you know, it's very, hard to, it's very hard to say, but there is a quality of focus, of concentration that comes from the audience or sometimes doesn't come from the audience. Uh, there, there's a certain kind of silence um, which isn't the silence of people sleeping. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't know how to tell you how we get it, because we don't spend time looking out into the audience. It's not one of, I mean, playing string quartets is not one of those entertainment professions where you actually address the audience uh, and, and expect to see eyes respond and, and smiles and that sort of thing. But, but we, we know if you're paying attention. And, and, and if you are, that's, that's the right atmosphere for us to play in. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, you yeah, anything to add to that as a final word? Just that there is really uh, often magic in the air. And it's, it's very hard to explain and, and, and catch it and, and verbalize it for me, but there's definitely when the audience, list, audience is with us, we can totally feel it. Yes. And if, when it's not. Yeah. One, one of the, the things over 35 years that I played quartets that I found to be um, a pretty consistent coincidence is that the better the acoustics in hall, the better the audience listened. Um, and you have in this room here a wonderful acoustic and a wonderful atmosphere and, and, and uh, my experience from having been here last year and, and, and again this year is that the audience here gets that, that they actually uh, revel in the sound of the music that's coming off the stage to them be because it's such a fine acoustical space. One last question for you, Mark, um, which I meant to ask earlier. Um, how difficult was it for you to fold your string quartet, to retire your string quartet, as opposed to um, reinventing it and bringing in new members and letting them go to it? Well, uh, the finality of it is undeniable. There, there's, when, when you bring in a new member, you, that's one thing you don't have to think about is finality. And we... I mean, we in our quartet agreed uh, when we were going to retire about five and a half years before the actual time itself. Uh, and so we had a long time to do the projects that we wanted to do and to play the repertoire one more time that we wanted to play and uh, to do a last Beethoven cycle and so forth and to record a couple of things that we'd wanted to record and so forth and so on. Um, but there comes the day when you get up the next morning and you look around and we, we used to call it getting up and going to, to look at the same three ugly faces. Um, and all of a sudden, those three ugly faces are not there. Uh, and in my, in my case, I moved from Chicago, where we had lived all of our career, to, to the state of Maine with my wife. And so I didn't even have them sort of walking the halls of the university anymore, or that sort of thing. I, I really, you know, sort of completely lost physical contact with my colleagues. And it was... Um, it's it's not like a divorce because we ended loving each other, but it's like an amputation. It's like it's just a missing piece. You know, you, you uh, I understand from people who've had a, a, a leg amputated that you still get phantom feelings in your foot, and that's I, I sort of have these phantom string quartet feelings sometimes. And I'm gonna I get up and it's and it's a few seconds before I realize I'm not going to rehearsal. So. Goodness, yeah. Well. Their loss and your colleagues' loss is our gain, and we're glad that you're here and delighted that you're here for a second time. And Jerzy, you, you're still alive and well and performing, and you have a concert to give in half an hour, so I'll let you uh, go to that. The uh, website for the Penderecki String Quartet is ps4.ca. PS4 
And for the Vermeer Quartet, there's a little about the Vermeer and uh, your, the recording of the seven last words of Haydn at vermeerqt.com. Festivalofthesound.ca is where you can find out more about the Festival of the Sound, this festival now celebrating its 30th anniversary. My name's Keith Horner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.